Um, okay, it's five o'clock, so we'll get this October 21st meeting of the Committee on Community Resources underway. We're hereby uh, convene, and for a few minutes anyway, I'll preside as Committee Vice Chair in the absence of our Chair, who's due any minute. But I guess the first order of business is to uh, start rolling. Sure. Councilor Deshera, who's on the way. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. And Councilor Nash. Here. And oh, I should uh, <clears throat> observe that we are being video and audio recorded. Uh, and now comes time for public comment. There's one member of the public here. It looks like he would like to speak. Your oh, Alex Barrett, Street High Street, Florence. Um, so yeah, I was interested to see the, the topic on the agenda today of the international codes and the voting on that. And um, I had a thought uh, about the question of affordability as we enact these sort of more stringent codes that essentially uh, cause the, the cost of new construction to rise. But it's only really the initial cost of new construction. You know, when you look at the lifetime of one of, of a home or, you know, or an office that has, with, with these more energy efficient codes, then um, you're most likely people will be saving money over that time. So, but how does that, how can we get that to translate? Um, so just, you know, it's probably not exactly what you'll be thinking about today, but just to be, uh, to have that in mind, because something I'm thinking about a lot is um, how do we have a program where you can kind of take the, the extra cost but, and the savings and amortize that and have banks recognize that energy savings. So something on that. Thank you for that, Alex. And I don't see anyone else from the public here. Uh, so next is approval of minutes of our May 20th, 2019 meeting, which have been distributed. Motion to approve the minutes. It's been moved and seconded. Any comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, so, okay. Um, so the, the main thing here today is, uh, well, I guess let me start off by recognizing our guests. You want to intro introduce yourselves as the uh, experts that are going to guide us through this? Uh, <clears throat> my name is Adele Franks, and I am on the Steering Committee of Climate Action now. And um, as such, I've taken an interest in um, the uh, <clears throat> energy efficiency the building codes, and um, and I have been uh, following along on the effort to update and upgrade the building codes, and therefore I have uh, been participating in a number of webinars and phone calls, etc., as an advocate, and um, and brought the suggestion to the Energy Commission here in Northampton that. We really need to get more departments on board voting because in the last year in Massachusetts we had a very, very small number of voters uh, on the new code for the last cycle, um, and uh, only one from Northampton. Uh, and that was the building commissioner. He was the only person from Northampton who voted on the la in the last code cycle. And we had, you know, many, many, many departments who could each have four voters. So uh, this time around, it looks to me like we're doing really, really well. We have at least 20 voters, maybe 24 voters. Uh, and it's been unclear whether one of the departments actually got officially recognized as voters or not, but we'll find out very soon whether that's true. So that's um, that's my qualification for being here. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Darren Port. I'm the manager of Buildings and Community Solutions for NEEP. Uh, NEEP is an acronym for the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships. And NEEP is one of uh, five Rio, six, six Rios rather, Rios are regional energy efficiency organizations. There are six around the country. Uh, our territory is DC to Maine and West Virginia. So the uh, 13 uh, Mid-Atlantic and Northeastern states and I give technical assistance to the energy offices in each of the states to uh, assist them in putting energy efficiency policies in place. And that can include anything from uh, code adoption to zero energy code policies, uh, all kinds of grid modernization, whatever it 
may be. Uh, so that's generally my background, and I'll talk a little bit more. I think Adele's going to make some broader comments, and I can talk a little bit about the significance, what this all kind of means for Massachusetts before we kind of launch into the, the bigger picture. Well, that's great. And wh where are you based? Where do you operate out? Uh, well, NEEP is there. The home office is in Lexington. Uh, that's where I was this morning. However, I live in East Hampton. Uh, he's a former resident of Northampton. I actually served on the Energy and Sustainability uh, Committee for, for a while. And I still have an office here uh, in, in Northampton that I work out of on a daily basis. So. Well, we're fortunate yeah. to have you both here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much Good for being here. here. So, the, what is what is our plan for proceeding? Can we put this in the context of, can you explain when there are actual votes to be taking, taken and this is all lead up to that, yeah. I gather? So the, so the um, <coughs> Massachusetts base building code basically <coughs> follows the IECC. Um, and then we also, we have two building codes in Massachusetts and there's a net zero, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, wishful thinking. Right, wishful yeah. We're getting thinking. there. <laughs> um, there's a stretch under the code that communities can adopt. 272 communities do adopt in Massachusetts the stretch energy code. And green communities have to. So um, over the last code cycles, the International Energy Efficiency um, uh, Committee, is that the name? Is that the right name? Anyway. Uh, the, the code has been improving. The base code has been improving. Um, and, and started improving a lot, a lot, a lot. And then over the last few code cycles, it's been like, yeah, 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 not much improvement. And the stretch code has fallen way behind where we should be. It's almost the same now as the base code. So there's a lot of interest in improving energy efficiency in the building code. And, um, and that was the whole effort behind getting more voters. Maybe we'll get a better code if we have, you know, the right kind of people voting on it. So that's how I that's that's how I got involved. Um, and um, and so uh, I'll go into exactly when the voting is going to occur. But basically, what I learned in the last webinar, which was just a couple days ago, is the most important thing for right now is to make sure that you're registered. And not only that, but that you have a username. Each person has a username, a password, and a PIN. Otherwise, you can't vote. So uh, once you get your, your uh, registration validated, and apparently they're, that's on a rolling basis, they're still working on validating all the voters. So I don't know whether you've all gotten your validation. All the today. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, great. So once you have your validation, then you can establish your, the, the, those three things, your username, your password, and your PIN. So you have to have that in hand before you can vote. So it's best to get it done in advance. Um, and then um, the, mo the next most important thing is for you to set a date and a time for when you're going to be voting together, because it's better to vote together than separately, and to plan at least 60 minutes for that effort. So. Um, I, I'm sure you've all gotten a copy of this provisional ballot that was recommended by a coalition, and I, uh, it's a large number of people and organizations in this coalition, from government bodies to environmental organizations, et cetera. But the, en the Energy Efficiency Code Coalition has put out this provisional ballot and um, <clears throat> is recommending basically that, that you uh, focus on voting on 80 uh, of the items. There's a, it was hard to tell in the call because two different people used two different numbers, but there's somewhere between 200 and 300 or so total number of items um, on the ballot, on the final ballot. And they're urging voters to vote on 80 of them, and they selected those 80 because those are the ones that would make the biggest impact in terms of energy efficiency. For commercial, for the commercial part of the code, they're aiming for at least a 10% increase in energy efficiency. And um, for the residential, I think it's a little bit less than that, but they're, they're prioritizing those that are they consider to be the most consequential. Um, so if there's something, let's say there are 300 proposals or, or ballot questions total, mm -hmm. and they're recommending that we vote on 80, does that mean that we're, we're simply kind of endorsing those 80? Do we also, could we also vote no on the other ones to make a statement, or are you, I mean, can we vote on as many as we wish as you can? You can vote on all of them yeah. if you would like. 
But if you don't know what you're voting on, whether it's good or bad, then it would be hard for you to decide whether to vote yay or nay. So if their recommendations are about 80 that they're recommending? No, no, 50 are yes, they're recommending that you vote yes. <clears throat> and 30, they're recommending that you oh, vote no because they're rollbacks. They're, uh, you know, going in the wrong direction. And, you know, I think that their provisional ballot that they've been circulating is really pretty self-explanatory. Um, and so, you know, I think it's very well constructed. Uh, and Are you referring they, to this document just to make I sure am referring to this document. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's color-coded so that uh, green is vote yes and right. red is vote no. <clears throat> right. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so sorry. So do you have your own independent opinions as to whether they've selected the right 80 and whether these are the, uh, uh, yeah. the right votes? I think I, I don't think they're in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, well, let me I'll give you a little bit uh, more background from where, for, from Adele. So uh, as Adele said, you know, the, there was these big jumps uh, from one code cycle to the to another, and the code cycles are every three years. So it's 2006, 9, 12, 15, 18, and we gained uh, between 2006 and 2012 about 30 percent efficiency. So we're really on this great trajectory of moving towards zero energy buildings, zero energy codes. But then in the last two cycles, we've gotten very little uh, efficiency gains, as little as 1.5% on the residential side from the 15 to the 18, and about 8% on the commercial side. Uh, so the advocates uh, this time around in the adoption of 2021 are really interested in seeing some efficiency gains, at least 10%, if not more. Uh, and, and uh, so, so that's a little bit of the, the background. In terms of Massachusetts, it's actually kind of unprecedented moment in time. Now, Massachusetts has always sort of been in the forefront of voting. Uh, DOER has always taken large contingents to the uh, hearings uh, and has come back and, and voted. But this time around, uh, there's over 420 potential voters in Massachusetts already registered. So Massachusetts in itself could overturn some of the rollback proposals or uh, advance the proposals that need a two-thirds majority to, to pass. Uh, so we're in a great position. You know, we're number one nationally as far as energy efficiency as a state. So now we really get to show our, our chops, if you will, on the national level again. Uh, so that, that's very, uh, very, very exciting for, for Massachusetts. As far as the voting guide, it's a little unusual this year. What has always happened in the past code cycles is that every efficiency organization uh, and then sort of every builder organization, uh, so N a National Association of Home Builders, AIA, U.S. Uh, Green Building Council, uh, and then all the efficiency organizations, so uh, RECA, Energy Efficient Codes Coalition, NBI, I'm just rattling off all these acronyms, put out their own voting guides. But this year, uh, for the first time, or this code cycle for the first time, all the efficiency organizations have convalesced around this one voting guide. So this is the definitive voting guide, if you will. It's the only one you'll see on the efficiency side. Uh, you'll see any number of voting guides on the rollback side or folks that perhaps are less interested in uh, efficiency gains. So, uh, so I pretty much explicitly trust this one. Uh, you've got sort of all the best you know, advocacy minds as well as building science people, policy folks uh, endorsing this voting guide. Uh, so really, as you know, Adele said, you could simply go down and check yes and no, um, or you can dive deeper into the uh, actual proposals and see what you know is appropriate, not appropriate. So there, there, you'll see how this is set up with like top uh, energy savers and then 20 individual energy savers, and then it goes to some efficiency rollbacks. Um, there's any number of proposals from sort of 
large universal proposals uh, that are applicable to all climate zones. Uh, but then when you start getting down deep into the proposals, you'll start to find proposals that are really only applicable, let's say, to one particular climate zone or one particular type of building. Um, so that's why they're saying, well, just go for these top 50 or this top 80 uh, and you know, go, go for those most important. Uh, what I put together today, if you're interested in going a little bit into the proposals, is that there's five sort of uh, universal energy efficiency proposals that the energy folks would like to see uh, voted on positively and accepted. And then there's, so those are sort of things like uh, a zero energy code appendix, uh, electrification ready homes. So these sort of general code provisions, if you will, that may or may not be adopted from state to state or municipality to municipality. Uh, but then there's the five biggest energy saving proposals. Uh, and then there's the five biggest rollback proposals. So I'm happy to go through those if you want, or we could kind of keep it higher level and you know, talk in more general terms. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I have a question it's kind of similar to the the question that Alex raised so yeah. that in terms of efficiency how it's slowed down over the last few sure. voting cycles yeah. what is, what's the barrier there is it that that you know there's a new level of efficiency that requires more cost or is it you know that there's that the technology costs more or it's yeah. What, what is that, or is it just? Yep, I, I can address that. So I, I guess a couple of thoughts. Um, first, that if you look at the proposals, the last uh, paragraph, the last section on each proposal is a cost estimate and a uh, return on investment uh, statement, if you will. So all of these proposals that are in there technically uh, have a seven year payback. Now the energy code, I like to say, is the only, of the only one of the codes that actually pays for itself. So it's a life safety code and it pays for itself over the uh, life cycle of the building in savings. And depending on the type of construction, the climate that you're, you're in, uh, it could be a, a small savings, it could be a large savings. Uh, some of the reasons why there hasn't been large efficiency gains as there has been in the past has to do primarily with politics. Uh, if you ever have the pleasure of going to a code hearing, uh, and you can watch the code hearings, uh, this, this one coming up starting on Sunday, they broadcast it all live. So if you have 12 hours a day for five days, you can, you can watch, uh, and it's it's like going to graduate school in a week, essentially, for building science. It's 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 pretty fascinating, uh, and you'll see all the uh, lobbyists, and you'll see all the efficiency experts, each presenting their side. Uh, so you know the builders, the National Association of Home Builders, they're always concerned about the first cost. So it costs more. Uh, but it's very interesting because the home builders, the sort of corporate office, if you will, is saying, you know, we're, we're not going to sell houses because we keep putting all these features in, we're raising the prices, it's, they're not affordable. But then the home builders have their own research center, and the research center comes out and says, consumers will actually pay more, up to $7,500 per single family home for these energy features. People want better indoor air quality, they want a healthier building, uh, they want Energy Star certification. Uh, so in addition to the granite countertops, they want these efficiency features and they're willing to pay uh, additional dollars for them. What was the amount that you sent? 7,500, $7, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
and that has you know I've seen other figures up to ten thousand, and I you know builders have put out you know less than seventy five, but uh, as well. But the research, the NHB research center said around that seventy five hundred that consumers will pay for upgrades in efficiency features. The other thing that has happened uh, in, in the past is the cost of the lobbying strength of the builders and a lot of the product manufacturers that are also concerned about first cost is that the builders and the International Code Council, that's the folks that write and adopt, publish the codes, uh, came to an agreement that for on every code committee, uh, there would be at least uh, five seats that are builders. Um, and so this has kind of changed the dynamic of what can get done or what it, you know, can't get done. Uh, and so that's why we've seen some less efficiency gains because of the interest of the bill is being represented uh, on these committees. They've either been able to defeat proposals that would increase efficiency or roll back uh, certain things that also would have added to, to efficiency. Um, so that's general thoughts on, mm -hmm. on costs. <coughs> that, you know. I was hoping that we could go back a whole bunch of steps. Yeah, um, and I've been kind of <laughs> somewhat deep in this through the Energy and Sustainability Commission, but yeah. um, my colleagues here might not have. And I think it's important for us to understand what this whole structure is, you know, who, how it affects the Massachusetts code directly. And maybe I'm speaking out of turn here and it's not necessary, but um, just a really quick overview of that I think would be really helpful. So can you so, be more So there's the ICC, there's the IECC, yeah. the code right. that comes out of the ICC. No. No, how sure. does it, Massachusetts adopts it? I mean, all of those yeah. pieces of how By this Massachusetts system no, works. Massachusetts adopts the, my understanding is that Massachusetts by law has to adopt the IECC recommended code. I would tweak it a little bit, but basically that becomes the base code. Yeah. Yeah, and then, there, then all, in addition, Massachusetts can um, um, adopt a stretch energy code for communities that wish to use the stretch code. Okay. All green communities are required to use the stretch code. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so there's two major code making bodies. On the residential side is the ICC, which is the International Code Council, uh, and on the commercial side is ASHRAE. Uh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, uh, Air Conditioning, uh, Air Conditioning, uh, Engineers. Uh, engineers. I looked it up today. Woo! All right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so essentially, the International Code Council uh, promulgates a whole suite of codes, if you will, not only energy, but plumbing, fuel gas, uh, pool and spa, structural, uh, residential code, commercial code. Uh, basically, if you, you know, it exists, there's a code for it. You know, if it exists in the built environment, there's, there's a code for it. So every three years is the same process. Uh, a committee is assembled. A call is put out for public comments. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a democratic process, if you will. It's, it's actually quite fascinating. Where anybody, anyone in this room, anyone in the public, can put in a proposal to make a change to the code. Uh, and let's say there's a new technology, you represent the new technology. You can put in a proposal to have that technology in integrated into the code. Uh, there's a new building methodology, like for instance, uh, straw bale construction, you know, building buildings using uh, straw. Uh, that was never in the code until uh, the 2015 code that became an appendix to the code. Uh, so that was a number of advocates who sat down, wrote the code, went to all the code hearings. It took them three code cycles to finally get it in. Uh, they proposed it in, in um, the, the residential code and that committee said no it doesn't belong there it belongs here so they had to come you know back three years later and and uh get into uh, you know uh the energy code whatever it, it you know whatever it may be so 
so the International Code Council promulgates these codes every three years, and then every state has their own mechanism for adoption. In Mass, as Adele said, there's actually legislation that requires the state to adopt the Energy Code within one year of it being published nationally. What the International Code Council publishes is what we call the model code. So that's kind of like the off-the-shelf code. What states very often do uh, is uh, adopt amendments. So you can change anything you want in the code. Uh, we always hope that you strengthen the code as opposed to weaken it. Uh, but a lot of times it, it's weakened. Some provisions, uh, let's say the code says that there has to be three air changes per hour in the house. Uh, a state might change it to five uh, just because they feel whatever, it's prohibitive to have three. Uh, we can debate that, but that's just an example of a weakening amendment and a common one that we, we see uh, quite often. So Massachusetts, within one year, of the model code being promulgated, they have to adopt. So that's why you'll see they, this happened with the ninth edition, and it's happening now with the tenth edition, uh, is that we're adopting the energy code in mass before all the other codes. So on January 2nd, 2020, the energy code uh, becomes effective in Massachusetts, but then it's going to take another year to get the structural code, the mechanical code, and the IRC and the IEC uh, into the 10th edition. And that's done for a number of different reasons. But, go ahead. So you say in January 2020, this new code? No, no. the 2018 version. The tw okay, yeah, we're yeah. Still, still adopting the 2018. Right, right. Yeah, this, the 2021, we won't see that until the end of 2020 maybe the spring of 2021. But, yeah, it depends how fast they move. I want to back up again. I'm yeah, still, no, I'm still like in please. the really early phases of understanding different parts of this. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is an international code council, so countries all over the world adhere to the work with the ICC yeah. and yeah. adhere to the, the IECC's code. So. What 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 is where did this even come from and why why doesn't every state create its own building codes or yeah. why does the United States adhere to an international you know an yeah. international organization that promulgates code and right. I, I just I would really love to understand all of that yeah good question well you, and you are going way back now mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, it used to be uh, through the late seventies is that each region in the country had their own code. So we had uh, Cabo Mech was the code in this region. Uh, California region had their own code. The Southwest had their own code. And it was essentially their own codes because it was based on climate zone. Uh, but then, you know, folks said, well, you know, shouldn't there just be one code, but then provisions for the different climate zones, which made a lot more sense because you had folks, particularly uh, like big box stores, so Target Corporation, they want to build in California, but they want to build also in Massachusetts. So, you know, it's a lot easier for that architecture firm to take one code off the shelf, look up the table for the particular climate zone. Uh, so it just brought the whole industry together. It also convalesced around one code uh, because of compliance. So it's easier for the Code Council to promulgate um, testing and certification for code officials to become certified in the code if there was a uniform code across the country. Um, I will say it is called international, um, but that I think there's only two or three international countries actually using it. The majority of codes outside of the United States are actually much stronger than the US code. Uh, so most countries look to our code and say, well, we can do better and they'll create their own code. Or there's programs like throughout uh, Europe that, that prescribe where energy needs to be. Uh, but I believe uh, Dubai uses the international code. They've adopted it. There might be uh, African country, I believe, that also uses it. So there's just a handful of international, um, but they, it was a marketing 
thing, quite frankly, they changed it to the International Code Council. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that was the beginning, and you know, now each state kind of has their own mechanism for adoption, how it's adopted, you know, like for instance, Maryland adopts it on a statewide level, but then it's up to each municipality to adopt it. And each municipality can strengthen the code, if they will. Um, New Jersey has a uniform construction code. They adopt the code at the state level, and that's what municipalities have to use. Uh, so it's different from, from state to state. Thank you. It's really helpful. <coughs> yeah, I yeah. appreciate it. And then it's the same on the commercial side. ASHRAE creates the commercial code. So the International Code Council, those codes are primarily for building four stories and under, except for the commercial codes, and it's four and up. Uh, and then ASHRAE is in all. So the, the ICC codes, the International Code Council code, references ASHRAE. Uh, so the commercial chapter, some states will adapt, adopt the commercial chapter of the energy code. Other states will eliminate that commercial chapter and adopt ASHRAE. It used to be that uh, the international code was two years behind ASHRAE. So ASHRAE was always a more rigorous uh, commercial code. But now ASHRAE and ICC have signed an agreement. So the commercial chapter of the energy code, the one that will become effective January 2nd in Massachusetts, is equivalent to ASHRAE, uh, which is a great thing that, that has happened. And what Massachusetts has done is they've strengthened the code. Uh, so they've actually taken uh, seven provisions, I believe it is, from ASHRAE and put that into the commercial chapter of the Massachusetts version of the code. And they say you have to pick four of those seven uh, to comply with the code. So they've strengthened the code. And they've put other <coughs> provisions in for like, solar ready, so a house has to be built to be able to put solar on later. Uh, some provisions for electric vehicles. So these are things that are uh, beyond the code, that strengthen the code. And then, as Adele said, there's green communities. Is that the same as kind of the stretch code for residential building, what you're talking about? No, it's it's different. The, the strengthening amendments that the state has adopted is part of the, the base code. Uh, and then on top of the base code is the stretch code. So the strengthening amendments are for all types of construction or commercial? Uh, no, all types, yeah. Uh, and there, the solar ready provision uh, pertains to single family houses. The EV is for commercial and multifamily. Uh, and the pick the four provisions of the seven is for commercial buildings, mostly you know, high rise uh, buildings. Yeah. Is there any movement to, say, bring us in line with one of the, let's say, one of the European? countries that have a stricter code yeah. so that we actually do have more of a international code um well that's certainly my organization's goal you know we we'd like to see all the codes go to to zero energy uh you know so we're you know we've got the technology right now it's all off the shelf and to build a zero energy home zero energy building uh, or just you know, a super efficient building that would be zero energy with, with the use of renewables. Uh, and so yeah, you know, we the code council is moving towards zero, uh, but you know, how long will it take to get there? When we're only talking about a two percent efficiency gain every three years, it could take a very long time. ASHRAE on the commercial side, however, they've committed to their code, their commercial code being zero energy by 2030. Uh, so ICC at one point had said that they would follow suit and get there by 2030, but that, it's not gonna happen, we don't think. Uh, however- Even if those gains start speeding up again? 
It could, right. I shouldn't say it, it will never happen. I suppose, yeah, if we come out of this with 15%, you know, in the next two code cycles or 15%, then yeah, we'd be pretty darn close, you know, to, to get there by, you know, 2027 code. Right? And so there's some, some states that are on track to get to zero. Uh, Washington, D.C., district. Um, they are adopting a code at the end of this year that has a zero energy appendix. And they're telling folks, like, this is, where, this is what's going to be mandatory in two more code cycles. So they're putting it out now, six years ahead of time, giving folks plenty of opportunity. And they'll support that appendix with all kinds of training and uh, incentives uh, over the next six years. But then come 2027, everything zero energy. Uh, Vermont just adopted a code which will become effective this summer that's 20% better uh, than the base code. New York just put out a stretch code that's 11% better. So they're moving towards a zero code. They'll eventually put out uh, a zero energy stretch code and then make that mandatory as well. Massachusetts, uh, there are there is a movement afoot. Uh, to adopt uh, a zero energy stretch code that might be the next version of the stretch code. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about it. It's uh, happening on many different fronts. Uh, Representative Comerford has introduced legislation uh, that's pending, will be reintroduced in the next session uh, for a zero energy stretch code. The BDRS has uh, committed to creating this uh, zero energy stretch code. Uh, NEEP has an initiative we call MAZE, Massachusetts Achieving Zero Energy, that's working to get to the zero energy stretch code. Uh, so we're optimistic. We really like to see Massachusetts get to zero you know, first. We've been first for all these years. Uh, so it, it would be great to see Mass get there. As well. so, this is the major impediment to building trades and building lobby? Yeah, I'd say NIOP is uh, they're, they're a commercial building uh, uh, organization. They're probably most opposed. Uh, they're very influential uh, lobbying organization. Um, you know, and then there's other other groups as well. You know, not all the realtors necessarily are for it. Uh, I'd say overall, most folks see the inevitability of the codes moving this direction, uh, but uh, but not not everybody's on board. Okay, one of the things that you will Del probably has more. Well, there's one of the things that you will be voting on in this round. Um, which is uh, called RE223. Yes, top of my list. Ah, top of his list. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it, which is a, a net zero option. Yes. So it would be a, it would be an optional part of the code, uh, but it would be wonderful. So, um, and um, I don't I don't know if it's worth going into, but our Massachusetts Board of Building Regulations and Standards is a, is a somewhat um, I would say backward organization. Um, that is trying to avoid doing uh, providing a net zero stretch code, <laughs> um, and so they they pulled a move within the last ten days, which was a pretty drastic um, step backwards. Yeah. They drastically altered the composition just by fiat um, of their energy advisory committee, um, dropped off all of the um, state employees and the architects, and added three more people or four more people from construction industry. So uh, they're clearly they're cl clearly not enthusiastic about a net zero stretch code, but um, fortunately we have our <laughs> politicians who are uh, working to try to yeah. make the right thing happen. I, I wanted to go, go go back to the affordability question again yeah. that, that, that Alex raised, sure. and <clears throat> where where does um, multifamily <laughs> and affordable housing fit in this and were the the community development corporations, the affordable housing community, were they have they been around the table on, on, on these discussions? What are they stating? In terms of Massachusetts? Yes. Yeah. 
the search <coughs> code or nationally? Well, either. Either, yeah. Um, yeah, certainly the larger organizations, folks like the Enterprise Foundation that are very involved in low-income housing <coughs> tax credits, uh, they're present, their voice is heard. Uh, so, you know, again, it goes back to first costs. You know, implementing the energy code certainly makes it more affordable for the resident, because you know, now you've got lower energy bills. Uh, but it could be prohibitive, you know, for the builder of the unit. But there's all kinds of ways to structure this sort of split incentive uh, situation where the residents could be uh, billed just a few dollars more a month than their, their usage, and that goes to offsetting these first costs. There's utility programs that will assist the builder to do that will incentivize the builder. Uh, there are low-income housing tax credit incentive programs that will incentivize efficiency and green building of affordable housing. Uh, and the, the more difficult is not so much the new construction as it is the existing, converting the existing to a more energy efficient, <coughs> getting existing all the way to, to zero. Uh, that's the more difficult part. But the code is in the back retrofitting. It's so not. No, no, so that's a so separate. Yeah. So I mean, there's some existing building, there's an existing building code, uh, but it doesn't dive as, uh, as deeply into sort of the retrofit or getting a retrofit to, to zero necessarily, or, or to be necessarily more energy efficient. In fact, it doesn't even address the efficiency in the code. You can still replace like for like. Uh, so, you know, if you open a wall, you have to bring that up to code, but if you replace a furnace, you don't necessarily have to replace it to the most, uh, the best efficiency possible, so, or the, the code efficiency, so. Yeah, so there's a lot still to deal with there. Um, well, how about for, for the affordability of, of, of single family homes? Yep. Um, uh, yeah. For, for home ownership programs for, for um, <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, a low and moderate income right. constituency that yep. there yeah I mean when I, I, I'm, I'm in the, in the process now of figuring out how to how to retrofit solar panels yeah. and there there are, right. besides the tax credits there there are some some pretty attractive incentives available for that right. but when you're doing new construction yeah. and you've got an extra twenty thousand dollars of cost that eventually over seven after seven years it's right. you know you're doing fine yeah but are there are there mechanisms for financing that extra twenty thousand dollars right at the outset on new construction there are there are mechanisms there are various programs I, I'm not familiar enough with the programs to be able to point you to them uh, but they they do exist uh, and uh, you know and that's why Massachusetts put this provision, the solar ready provision in, because they re recognize that folks might not be able to put the panels on. You know, they've just gone through this expensive building, new construction, but at least have it prepared. So when, you know, three, four years down the road, you've recouped a little, uh, or maybe incentives are even better, or the state's giving away solar, you know, your home or your building is ready. It's got the, the wire chases, it's all, you know, ready, ready to go. So there are various programs. Uh, there's power purchase agreements, so you don't have to lay out any of the first costs. Uh, there's community solar, so you don't necessarily even have to have the panels on your building. You can still take advantage of clean, renewable power, but not necessarily have it on, on your site. Uh, so there are mechanisms. I think we'll, be, we'll see more and more. You know, as we push more for zero energy code and more for efficiency, you know, the utilities recognize that renewable is going to be a bigger and bigger part of their portfolio uh, and, and that the grid will have to become more efficient. Uh, so, so we'll see more incentive programs, more financing type programs uh, emerging as, as things get uh, tighter. I know this is a little far afield, but the yeah. things like the solar ready Moves and a lot of that, um, I think, is going to end up backfiring just because 
the technology is changing so quickly that creating readiness is not going to be the, the kind of readiness that's created isn't necessarily translatable five years from now and somebody might have the funds to actually yeah. install something but that's not really relevant to what we're talking about but right. I'm always interested in this concept of you know making things ready for a technology that you know exists now when five years from now it might not be relevant yeah the technology or the readiness yeah certainly I mean I guess there's no guarantees for sure uh, and, you know I don't think things move that rapidly in terms of the technology I mean there's always new technology in this the more off-the-shelf technologies like thermostats per se you know that sort of rapidly changes but things like heat pumps and solar panels and furnaces that's slower to evolve so I think five years is a pretty short time frame I think if you go out to maybe ten years then yeah you might see some issues um, you know, but, but all we're saying is you know if you're gonna even you know if there's even the possibility that renewables are going to go on that building or that home, you know, be sure to leave room to put that uh, the, the inverter in the garage. So you need that panel, that blank space. You know, it could be as simple as that, just a blank space where that's where the inverter would go. You know, ten years or um, in five years, you know, EV charging might be more relevant, or more folks will be doing it. Uh, so, you know, is there a place to have that connection, you know, immediately to, to the garage door, things like that. So it's sort of uh, foreseeing what's coming down the road. And I know Darren had been prepared to present in greater detail some of the specific code proposals, so we weren't sure how much detail you guys wanted to get into or how much you're going to need to bring to city council when you're presenting the voting proposal to them do you need to be able to explain what some of the ones that you're going to be voting in favor for actually are so that was another um yeah. area that i just said two two three is top of your list sorry yeah two two three so i've got five uh six that are kind of these universal proposals that we'd really like to see it, into the code. Um, so, right, one, uh, Bill mentioned this is zero energy appendix, that's uh, 223. What this would simply do is give states and municipalities the option to, to go zero energy if they want. Uh, so it doesn't have to be adopted. Some states don't even adopt the uh, appendices. Uh, but for those who want to, at least they have that option. Um, so here's a code that can be used by any state, any jurisdiction across the country. It, it simply just gives them the option to, to be able to, to have zero energy. Uh, uh, code. Um, so that's one. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we see a lot of jurisdictions taking action, wanting to get to zero, then having to go through this long process and the politics of you know, getting a zero energy stretch code and people making these moves to derail that process and so forth. So you know, here it is in, in code, it's off the shelf, you know, ready to go. And, uh, so you know, and it, it doesn't, it, so this, this is a type of proposal where there's not necessarily any efficiency gain like right out of the box that you actually have to do it you know where there's other proposals uh like the flex point proposal where you know, that would be a five percent increase in efficiency in the built into the code right away um, so that's kind of the difference between some of these universal um, codes like for instance uh, re 147 which is uh, electric uh, electrification ready so what we'd like to see to combat, you know, climate change and is uh, buildings go all electric. Uh, and this is what, what's happening in California. So for years and years, California has been promoting renewables, getting all uh, homes and all buildings to have renewables. So uh, 2020, all residential structures have to have renewables. 2025, all commercial buildings. 
And now California is saying, well, that's, that's all well and good. So we, now we've got clean electric, but we still got buildings emitting greenhouse gases. So we've got to get rid of those fossil fuels. So how do we do that? We go all electric. How do we go all electric? We put batteries for storage in the, in the homes, and we go to heat pumps. Uh, so you have heating and cooling, you know, electric heating and cooling, and you can draw at night from those batteries. Uh, so what we'd like to see with RE147 is that homes are, again, just electric ready. So you know they've got the wire chases, they've got the area in the garage where you would attach the inverter, or there's a place on the outside where you would put the heat pump, or whatever it, it may be. Uh, so that, that's another proposal, not necessarily an efficiency gain you know, off the shelf from the code, but something that's very important to the goals of the efficiency community you know, down, down the road. I, I kind of feel like before yeah. we start going proposal by proposal, I don't know how much time we have to do that. We're talking about 50 proposals. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. <laughs> that we as a committee need to talk a little bit about what how much we feel like we need to know and what we're actually presenting to our colleagues on the council mm -hmm. when we present this so that we're not kind of taking up time. And then the other question I guess I have that is directly related to that is, um, is there somewhere um, that goes, something that goes with this that explains in more detail what each of these is so that if we had questions, we could then read it from on the floor of the council or something right. like that? Yeah, so I, I don't, so this is a, a five page document and I believe that pages four and five are gonna have some more of that information. Uh, but what you can also do uh, is the code council, the International Code Council, puts out a residential and a commercial monograph. Uh, so this has all the proposals uh, it's got the cost estimate uh, on the bottom of the proposal. And then it's got public comments that were made. So they, they publish the proposals, then folks are able to send in their comments. Uh, and all of that is in this monograph. It's about 1,100 pages each. Uh, and so all of these are explained uh, in, in detail in that. In, in the monograph. And we know where to find that? Yeah, I've downloaded some of those for the commercial code and the residential code. And like you said, they're like hundreds of pages yeah. long. Yeah, it's 1,100 pages. And it would even it'd be possible to cut and paste the ones that's that are referenced yeah, that's here. Yeah. And that's sort of what I did with some of them. Right. But yeah, like I said, yeah. even like a single code in some cases, code change yeah. proposal can be see. pages. Right, yeah, it could be <coughs> but pages. There's, right. Yeah, there's also. Their, um, their webinar contains general descriptions, too, of the, um, the EECC had a webinar where they were sort of more yes. general terms describing. Yeah, the EECC changes. has a webinar that explains it. Uh, NBI, uh, New Buildings Institute, also has a webinar, and they explain a lot of the proposals. So I can get you these links if you need them. Uh, uh, There's also a webinar on November 6th specifically for new voters. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. So, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, there'll be a lot of support. Yeah. Councillor Shera. So, um, so we're being, so has energy and sustainability weighed in on these? In other words, so there was, this <coughs> action was sponsored by other councilors who were who've been doing a lot of work on this around his energy and sustainability. Looked these at it. these just came out, right. and the Energy and Sustainability Commission hasn't met since then. But there are five other offices in the city that are voting in Chris Mason's office. The Planning and Sustainability is one of them. Right. But the the as a body, the um, the NESC isn't voting, and won't be discussing these specific things. But each of those departments is going to have to develop its own internal process to understand them. So, so they don't have recommendations per se from like right. Chris Mason or from the NESC or anything like that. We're using this, the IECC's 
recommendations as our recommendations. Yeah, the, the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition, not, not the ICC. The EEC. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and there is this um, hearing uh, in Las Vegas, yeah. October 23rd to 30th. Very long. Well. They are pretty intense. But, um, yeah. It, yes, yeah. it sounds like we should tune in and watch this it's, on television. It's huh? better than a daytime soap opera. <laughs> <right? laughs> uh, which, which you're all entitled <laughs> to go to, by the way. You're yeah. as voters, you could attend. Yeah, yeah, they're but, free. Uh, uh, but but the, there might be some changes. Like this yes. provisional ballot is not the final ballot. That's right. Because there may be Good some point. jockeying around and some changes that, that result from this week long yeah. hearing. Is it so someone's recommendation? No. Yes, no, it goes all, it's been around the city, it's been, yeah, it goes. They just had uh, one recently in Arizona. Arizona, Arizona. Like yeah. The least efficient place. So it yeah. could be, could it be that some of these that are on the recommendate, rec, recommended list by of the EECC like be irrelevant after the conference? I, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of changes to this. I think there, there's some proposals that will get clarified. So the, before the final ballot, if you will, was put on the website, there could be some proposals that are withdrawn. That, that could happen next week at the hearing, where sometimes different people get together and they say, oh, you know, your proposal, my proposal, your proposal all does similar to the same things. Maybe we can put them all together. Uh, so that might happen. So something might drop off or a number might change. Um, someone might just withdraw a proposal altogether. Uh, it, there could be some things that were amended on the floor at the committee hearing that might have something that's not kosher about it. Like you know, when they go back and review the videotape and the and the uh, committee's actions. It, there could have been some violation of the rules, and so that, therefore, that proposal, that modification that happened on the floor might not still be modified as part of the floor vote. So there's these little things. But overall, I think this is pretty darn close. It could be just a few that, that change. We're just saying that Chris Mason sent out to the five departments that are registered to vote today the this same PCC uh, guide. So you know, presumably he's encouraging them all to okay. also all use this. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'd offer, uh, you know, I'm willing to come back. Obviously, I'm, I'm here almost every day in Northampton. So if there was another meeting wanting to be scheduled just to dive into the proposals, or again, you know, like what I came kind of to just talk about is the my you know not my necessarily choices but this is sort of the energy advocate saying well here's the top five or six sort of universal proposals here's the top five biggest efficiency gains and here's the top five potential rollbacks that you should definitely vote no um, so I mean even if you just did that you know those 15 16 uh, but then of course you know, you've got the voting guide, you could simply you know, go down the list, yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, there's any number of ways that it could be done. Uh, I'm wondering if we want to ask Adele and Darren to um, be available when we bring this to the full council in the case there are questions. You, but, yeah, yeah, in case there are questions that we just right. can't answer. Because I feel like I mean, it is. we're try trying to predict what we might people might want us to go in depth on is hard. Um, yeah. And we can bring the kind of written stuff so that we have it available, but it might be nice if you're both available to be there just in case we need you your bring a 1100 page documents with you okay. we can say like <laughs> yeah. shall we read this now <laughs> right. that'll, yeah. that'll make them okay. it's either you can right. read this 1100 page or you can just wrote it are you available from seven o'clock on a thursday night until yeah. three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> right yes well <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to come back, depending on the date, uh, you know. And we would ask if we could do it sort of earlier in the evening and, yeah. you know, try and accommodate. Right. Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I've been on two uh, code committees. Well, I've been on more than two, but two ICC code committees uh, where 
these co you know, we've vetted all the proposals. You know, there have been some 700 proposals, and we've been in a room for 12 to 15 hours a day for seven days, and like so, nothing matches the intensity of that. So, I'm more than happy to come for a few hours and talk about codes. So, uh, about codes. Um, yeah, whatever's helpful, really. Thank you. Uh, you know, and I know uh, if. Adele is not available. I know that folks from uh, MCAN or MAPC uh, could, are more than happy to come out. They're offering technical assistance. Uh, you know, they're more on the nuts and bolts how the voting works kind of thing and how to access the CB, CBD, ac, CBD access program. CBD, yeah. Yes. CBD, right? CBD, yeah. yes. Code it's development process, is that what that stands for, I think? Yes, code development process, yeah. yeah. It used to be at the hearings, you would vote right there on the floor. Um, they gave me these little little keyboards, if mm. you will. And so, but it you know, it wasn't really representative because not every code department was able to send, you know, 40 people or whatever right. it may be. So, so this is a much more, yes, I think, democratic process. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think we'd known we could have put in <laughs> travel budget. requests. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Vegas for a week. <laughs> but, you, but as far as it, the schedule stands right now, you have to vote by um, November 27th. Yeah. Right. So I think we the figured out project. how to make our schedule work. Jim, did you have something? Right. Well, yeah, it, it's kind yeah. of procedural. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think we should send this forward to council. Is this is our recommendation so I'd like to make that motion and that um, because just so I'm understanding so what we're recommending to council is how we recommend that we want to vote once it's approved by we have to get it done by the 21st or something at council we're doing two votes on the 21st right, right. so yeah, so we send this forward to council, we do two votes, and then we can go meet and vote. Okay, so that's the motion. Is there a second? And then <laughs> well, we'll I'm second. just going to make a procedural I'll, I'll, question I'll, as well. I'll, 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 I'll second the motion for purposes of discussion. Okay. okay. <laughs> to offer an amendment, a friendly amendment to that, which would be that we send this out together with um, a link to the explications of each of these proposals so that council members can do their own homework and background. <laughs> We're doing our due diligence that way. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. And you, uh, we, uh, <laughs> may I speak while you're in, while there's a motion on the floor? Yes. Um, <laughs> you would want to make sure you were sending the updated um, ballot, which will probably be that. different than this one here. Yeah. But you'll have that by then. But the EECC won't put out a new one of these. Yes, they will. But yeah, they'll well, put out an updated one. But again, I think early November. It'll, oh, okay. it'll be it'll be pretty darn close. I don't think you're going to see it, any major changes. Mm -hmm. This is going to be yeah. pretty pretty close. It seems like it makes sense though to wait for the finalized one right. as opposed to. <coughs> Remind me right. of the calendar. So are we we meet here before that council November meeting where we do the two. Mm -hmm votes so we could move that then at the at our November meeting does we that have it? to have it on the agenda by the following morning essentially though because we meet on Monday the 18th yeah we can do that and then we have to have it by noon <coughs> to four or whatever we're doing we can do that yeah of course that doesn't give them very much time to yes but on the other hand I think they are largely yeah, delegating to us the, the due diligence and the homework. <coughs> so I doubt too many would object to having only two days. Right. That happens all the time where legislative matters meet Monday right. and right. put things forward for the right. agenda. Right. So, yeah. But it would make sense to wait until we have the amended version of this. To, to, yeah, I could send out. ask, I can email Bill Fay from the ECC and ask them when they think uh, I can let you know. They, what they think, how many changes they think, and when the final version. Um, and the other available. question I'm wondering about is would it be useful at our November 18th meeting or any other time? Because we might want to invite the other departments that are going to be voting 
if we want to invite somebody from MAPC to come to talk to us about the nuts and bolts of the actual voting process, mm -hmm. but to make it available to everyone who's voting in the city. Voting opens what day again? November 13th. Right now it's the 13th. So is it possible that some of them will have voted by then? Maybe, I guess. But we could do a meeting earlier is what I'm suggesting oh. where we invite others and somebody that could they're going to come from Boston, right? They're MAPC's Boston based. Probably, yeah, unless they know someone closer, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, MCAN or MAPC would be Boston. Yeah. Couldn't this be done by Zoom? Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, is this room set up for Zoom? Can yeah. we do that? Can we do a Zoom meeting from here? Technically, I don't know. Um, <coughs> Yeah, or Skype. We can put agendas that, up there. We'd have to look yeah. at their, their special rules for, the special open remote meeting law rules for remote participation. Yeah. The Human Rights Commission has Skyped people in and just yeah. put it up. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and they checked it all with the okay. NIC wall. So I think we're, we can do it. It's okay. just we have to make sure we have the technology. Did they do it in here? Or they? In here. Yeah. 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 Yes. But this wouldn't be a, a meeting of a, um, a designated body that's subject to open meeting law. You would just be inviting people from all these different departments. And the four of us couldn't be here. It has to be. It, it has to be. Law. Yeah. We the four of us can't meet on anything because we're a quorum of a body without. Okay. I, yeah, I understand. Being, oh. So yeah. it have to be publicly announced. And, and yeah. The public it would have to be public public yeah. Meeting. It could be a meeting, our meeting, but we could. I'm just suggesting yeah. that we invite these other people who are voting in the city yeah. to yeah. come yeah. as an opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be great if someone could actually physically come out here, but if we have to Skype them in or Zoom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. I wish I thought to do that last week. I sent out an email today letting the different departments that were about to let know that there was a meeting this afternoon that everybody you know, was interested. It just didn't occur to me, really. Yeah. Well, both the MATC and ICANN asked me to kind of report back after this evening. And so I'll, I'll send them an email tomorrow and say, yeah, we met. It was great. And they're interested in having somebody come out. And I'll direct them to you to work on the logistics, so I'm sure they'll, they'll find something. Else. So we should probably come up with a couple of potential dates. Yeah, I feel like the dates are going to be challenging. Meeting. Are they going to be challenging? Well, that's, that's why we're doing two readings. Right? November 18th is the next week. When, when do you think the um, finalized uh, ballot will be publicized in the EEC? I, I, I don't know for sure. I mean, I, I, I kind of feel strongly that it, this one it is good to go. I, I think, again, the changes are going to be really minimal. I, I don't think it's going to throw off, like, folks, like, I don't think anyone's going to think, first of all, we got to start all the way back from the beginning. You know, these major proposals are the major proposals. I think if anything, we see one is dropping off. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'd feel confident if I was in your shoes of, Send this out with caveat, you know, some things may mm -hmm. change closer, but this is so we could this is the most do that important. Any time, I guess. Uh, and going back to the thing that's on the floor, the motion that's on the floor so okay. But if um, yeah. the, the Las Vegas meeting is happening very soon, so if you wait until after that, presumably if there were any changes. Be, yeah, it, be known. it wouldn't actually happen right after. It would probably be like another week mm -hmm. later, I think, because I think what then ICC staff has to go back and review everything that happened mm -hmm. and see if there's any procedural issues mm -hmm. or see what was withdrawn. So they would know something. So I'm thinking that you know, if this is updated, then it's probably another week at least after. Um, but again, I, I can get clarification from EECC um, on that. But I, I, again, I, I think it's going to be very minimal um, changes. Yeah. So 
I think you just answered my, my question. So yeah. minimal changes like RE223 is absolutely going to be on there no ma matter what. That's your, one of your big ones, right? Absolutely. And so, so yeah. it'll actually just be little tweaks. Yeah. And if we needed to, we could possibly amend it on the floor when we bring it to council. So. Yeah, issue an addendum. Okay. So. But this is the framework where, you know, 95, 97 percent of this is what's going to be on the ballot. I I say so. Okay. Yeah, I feel pretty confident in that that they, yeah, would not have issued this without serious regard to what's on here, and then if there are changes, it'll be minimal changes it'll be the withdrawals uh, or yeah just small tweaks to it. and then you know it might not even necessarily be the change to these numbers I think things could drop off of here and maybe something could be added on in its place but I think the bigger change might actually happen in the proposal um, so if there's they like said some like a floor amendment that wasn't kosher and is going to be withdrawn or is withdrawn by the proponent at the hearing uh, that could switch up so it might they'll publish a final monograph as well um, or they'll publish an addendum actually they won't publish another monograph they'll publish an addendum with any changes but it's things are I'd say like I said 95 to 97 percent there okay. you know, at, at this stage of the game Um, so the motion's still on the floor. So do you feel good about doing that? Sending it forward now. And then, um, and then we could invite, we could invite the other departments to come to the 18th and say, if you want, you know, we're going to have this discussion. If you want to hold off on your voting, we're going to have this discussion. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, yeah. are y'all going to vote together or are you going to Designate one. That's another um, way you could do it. You could. Can we get a pizza party? You know, you could all sit here, bring your laptops, and all vote together as well. That's the recommendation of the we webinar. That's the recommendation. For all the yeah. Yeah. Setting up a meeting yeah. for Monday, November twenty-fifth, if I recall, to vote together. Yeah. We just talked about right, it. Right. Right. If you guys do approve this motion to send it forward to council, couldn't you actually bring it to council well, that's on the seventh and then wondering. have the voting meeting earlier than the 25th, like, you know, more towards the, because I don't see any reason. Right. You couldn't, that's why we're holding it. Let's do it. Oh my God, our meeting on the, it's going to be a really packed, especially if you vote on the 18th. Oh, the water. You could use that meeting, kind of sort of voting meeting. The 18th is already scheduled. If the council approval has already been received oh, yeah. uh, for the voting guide. Right, right, right. We're looking at meeting on the 18th. Rather than having two more meetings. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> right, so vote on the, have it go to council on the 7th and then vote on the 18th. Mm -hmm. My only concern would be thinking of our council president, who's a bit of a stickler for rules, that he might say, well, if we have the time, why don't we do two votes? Not do two votes, okay. vote on the 7th and then vote on the 21st. Sure. There is the potential for that to happen, and mm -hmm. I want to verify with him that he would be okay with mm -hmm. doing two votes on the seventh, so that we don't get caught off guard with it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. There's so many moving parts to this. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Well, is there anything else we need a Dell and Darren for? They don't need to watch it. I, I, I had just schedule. one matter, you know, question of the substance of a proposal. If we can, can divert, we can close our divert from procedural stuff for just one second before. Is, is there anything in here with regard to uh, uh, solar alignment of, of, new, of new buildings? Um, yeah. I, I, I at one point heard the statistic. I'm, I don't know that, that if. In the last 30 years, every home in New England had been built with proper solar alignment for maximizing passive solar effect that would right. eliminate the need for two super power plants. Right. And wh wh where, did, where does that 
Where, where does re require, re you know, it's one thing to build in solar ready, it's another to right. require maximal solar, exposure. Expo passive solar exposure yeah. to begin with. Hmm. I, I don't know for sure if there's any proposals. I mean, certainly, you know, everyone talks about that making the most sense. It's been talked about forever, and I forever. so I wonder why it doesn't. But I think uh, that's also something that you could deal with locally through zoning. You certainly could. It could. It'd be great to have it, yeah, built in. Yeah. Um, I, I could see that being pretty controversial, but uh, so I don't know. We could, I, mean, I know we it could has to do with the way streets it, are aligned yeah. and yeah. grids are laid out. I know, but it's yeah. still maximizing. Yeah, and with new building, it's maximizing the space usage. And I know it's kind of, it's yeah. complicated, yeah. but there's such a huge opportunity to capture gain there. I just yeah. curious what the state of the art thinking is on that. Yeah, yeah, I I, I don't know for sure. I can't say I know every proposal. Yeah. But, okay. Um, I'm, d I'm just querying some uh, to see if there's any. I put in solar alignment, but nothing came up. I put in passive, what other term would I use? Yeah. Um, hmm. Okay. We've talked about that a, a bunch of times, times in the orientation, solar orientation. Yeah. and Louis Hasbrook, who sits on it, says it's just it's so it's been impossible with developers and. You know, almost like local kind of lobbying against it. So, like a subdivision, it would be easy. You know, well, yes, new new subdivisions. Stuff as many in as they can. New subdivisions should be just laid yeah. out that way from the start. Yeah. No, it seems like a total no brainer, doesn't it? But, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times, folks will redo their site plan to orient everything east west and find, oh wow, well, I could put two more units. Uh, and, you know, they'll be so resistant and then you'll sit down in, yeah. in a planning meeting like design charrette and let's align, you know, just for, for fun, let's just align everything, you know, east west and wow, look, you were gonna do thirty, now you can do thirty two and you know you Well because it, it, you historically if you look at if you look at the and, way farmhouses and yeah. New England construction yeah. used to take place. Yeah. Generally uh, just took that into account just because it, it, it made sense. No yeah. building codes required, it's just yeah. somebody who was who sort, sort, sort of understood right from the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's a lot of things we used to build more in tune with right. natural rhythms. And, right. Yeah. You know, you go down to Asbury Park in uh, New Jersey and you go to the streets that are right by the ocean and they, they're actually very wide. They, they're, you know, they funnel back basically so they start wide and they go and that's to capture the breezes you know so like people were thinking about this when they did those sort of you know urban layouts and whatnot but you know there's yeah so, mm -hmm. um, okay so so right now the motion is to move it to council move these recommendations to council and uh, with the link to the larger explanations. Um, are we ready to make that decision? Do you, you feel like we need, need to, to finish? With regard to the date, if we want to do it for November 7th, as opposed to. Did your motion have a date in it, or did you just referral generally? I have a date. So we can do it. Now and that's separate from when we're actually bullying. Okay. Or, or we could just do that as a separate recommendation so that one doesn't get screwed up. We just have this is a positive recommendation with the link, and then on top of it, we recommend two readings on council for this. That would be a separate thing. And then we could have that discussion, and then. Okay, why don't we why don't we vote on moving it forward and then um, either one of you maybe wants to check in or I can check in with the council president and ask um, in terms of how many meetings he feels would be necessary for the voting on it. Um, maybe we could take two votes over right. seven and <coughs> then the allow us to have out. this timeline. Vote yeah. Earlier. Right. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Do you want to release our guests if they're interested in anything? Um, let's just. All those in favor of moving this forward, council. Aye. Aye. Um, yes. 
Yeah. Thank so you. what's the two votes? I lost you on that one. No? Oh, we Thank take you. two. So procedurally, we yeah. take two votes on everything. Um, and it's yeah. supposed to be in two separate meetings, which allows oh, time to okay. answer questions or get right. further information. But we can suspend that rule and have two votes done on one right. at that first night. But um, we right. like to have more time for public input yeah. if we can. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adele, for yeah. just amazing organizing and yeah. getting In two meetings to today. Yeah. Right. But this is all because of Adele yeah. that this is happening. Yeah. Going yeah. to city departments, coming to the Energy and Sustainability Commission. Don't shrug it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Adele. I'd like, awesome. I'd like to think that it would have happened anyway, but. Probably not. We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> it's nice of you to think that, but we know that you are quite a force. What's, uh, what's really exciting is how many departments we got to sign up. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Over Thank 420 you. Pe you know, people registered in that. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's pretty, pretty exactly. remarkable. That's a record. Yeah, that's right. Good. Yeah, that's right. So are you, because you said you cover 13 states, yeah. are you actually doing this kind of consultation with like all these different states and municipalities? Uh, I don't know. It's funny. I was just talking with my supervisor today and you know, I said, well, let's see how it works out tonight. And I'll let MAPC and can know that you know, we're available to do it. But yeah, no, I certainly won't be doing all 13 states, maybe a few. Massachusetts towns. Uh, so we're lucky that you uh, came to us. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. anytime. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, you bet. Thank Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Take care. Um, I don't have a copy of the agenda, but I don't think there's anything. Oh, no, I think you covered the agenda. Yeah. 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 So I wanted more clarification yeah. of how we're proceeding. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, sorry, I just wanted to make sure I understand that. Does it depend on the answer that comes back from Ryan if he's willing to entertain right. two readings on the seventh? Or so if he'll do two readings on the seventh, then on our eighteenth, our meeting on the eighteenth, we could vote. We could right. have that be a voting meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. If um, he feels strongly, it should be two readings on separate days. Um, so if we do it on the seventh, then that leaves out the possibility of us meeting with somebody from MACP about the voting process, correct? Or, or they came on the 18th. Or if they came on the 18th, yeah. Or the day that we actually vote, you mean? Or we could still keep, we could have the 18th be the day that they come and we can invite the other departments and tell them we're doing it so that they want to wait until after to vote. Um, and then still have that day on the 25th and vote. So we have to make a decision about that because we have to. How long do we think the actual voting will take? That's they said allow an hour. Oh, okay. For and this I many proposals? Or yeah, I think it's point and click. <laughs> well, if, if, if. Like once you're in there, it's like. Click there. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we're clear on what you do, you just go in and it's kind of a mechanical thing at that point. So I'm not sure where the hour would be. Well, we could reserve the possibility of having that meeting, having them come on the 18th, have everyone meet, and then we could vote if we felt like we could. Right. Here. Yeah, I wouldn't think covering this many proposals would take that long. Right. right. And there's 265 commercial, and like, they said 225, if you guys wanted the option of casting further votes. Right. I mean, it doesn't sound, sounds like you guys are satisfied with I think so. sending this forward. And yeah. Well, and if on the 18th it turns out, for whatever reason, we don't have the time to actually do the votes, we can do the votes on our own. Isn't that, isn't that Yeah, correct? why did they recommend doing it together, you know? You know, I think you guys have had more preparation than maybe some people with less preparation um, would need, you know, and... Uh, together so you I don't know coaching. if someone can stand at the front of the room and say, CE 113, um, you know, like a right. bingo. And, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's helpful to can have we, someone call out the numbers. And can we look at, once it's up, can we look at it, or does that like start the trigger that like you're then voting, you know what I mean? You know, it's not available yet in the CDP access module, right. if that's what you mean. Like, but, I Well, I mean like if it opens on the 13th, is that right? Like yeah. once it opens, can we go in and look at it without voting, I or once so. you're in there, are you 
this, I'm, you know, I'm it's like a survey. You have to take a PM yeah. then so that you can look at right. the format that it's in because it's not there now. Like I thought maybe there'd be some kind of sample right. format to look at, but it doesn't seem to be. Hmm. Yeah, it says well, ICC governmental voting representatives will be able to view the hearings and uh, after the public comment hearings and vote. So, so it's got to be available and visible. Yeah. So what do we think? Maybe we should, can we just hold the 25th? But we'll try and do it all on the 18th. And the purpose of the 25th would be to vote as a group if we yeah. don't get to it on the 18th? Yeah, that was the date that we had held to vote as a group. But the other possibility is we could skip the whole MAPC thing and we'll just figure it out, you know? Yeah, what what help me, what, what would be the purpose of MAPC coming, coming in? I guess because what Darren was talking about, and I think Dell and I had a conversation about this at some point, but for some reason it is considered a fairly complex process to do the voting. And so MAPC is offering technical support or assistance around how the voting actually gets done. But really, I mean, I think we're smart enough that we can figure it out. We can forego that. And if we can't, if we can't figure it out as a group on the 18th, we can, we can still follow up and vote individually once we understand it better without having to convene on the 25th. What if we had them come and we? the other departments come as well and they use us as the test example on how to vote when we do our voting as they're showing will be the example mm -hmm. yes i don't know i keep doing that yes. so I like Darren that. writes back that they'll make themselves available our only option is our our meeting time on the 18th for them to come right unless you schedule another <laughs> meeting with the other <laughs> right Give them an ultimatum. So should we invite them? I think Nicole Sanchez is one of the staff people there who's absolutely available to cool. invite someone from MAPC. Yeah. I thought they were giving would be giving more of an overview similar to what Adele gave today, where they're more saying just the voting process in general. And the, the, I guess we need to clarify yeah. that. Yeah. Rather than going through this tech assessment, how to vote with CDP right. access module. Seems like they'd be happy to come. So, okay, we all feel good about this. Yeah. So we're not adding any dates. We're not adding any, any dates, but we are still holding the twenty fifth just in case. Um, yeah, and we're fifth on the twenty fifth, or five on the twenty fifth. Love that. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Um, anyone have any other new business or anything else to discuss? Thank you a to motion the to vice chair oh. for kicking us off. I apologize. That bridge traffic. Bridge traffic. I'm really getting you these days. Bridge yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Were you about to make a motion? I was about to make a motion yeah. to that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, okay. everybody.